Greetings, academic proletariat, and welcome to this fireside chat where we will be reviewing territorial expansion throughout the ages. If you have any questions, go ahead and hold on to them until the end, and I should be able to help you sort them out. Okay, so just an overview, if you don't have uh, guided notes for this one, uh, we're going to talk about five different eras of territorial expansion in American history. So we're going to begin with early colonial expansion and talk about revolutionary era expansion, then talk about manifestiny in the mid 1800s, then talk about westward expansion, post Civil War in the late 1800s, and finally round, round it out, all out with imperialism during the late 18 and early 1900s. So to kick things off, we're going to look at a source from each of the eras. So this one you might recall and be it kind of Rainy, I apologize, but this is the famous errand into the wilderness. It's an idea of how Puritans, or at least people living in New England in the early 1600s, saw their uh, place in that area and how they viewed westward expansion. They, of course, saw the wilderness being anywhere out into the woods off the coast where they had originally run into. Um, but they thought that they were running an errand, which means that they were doing a favor for somebody and that somebody being God. Of course, they thought that their job was to go into the wilderness, tame the heathen beasts, uh, and bring civilization to the otherwise heathenous Native Americans that uh, were fur further inland. Okay, so this is how the Puritans saw themselves uh, around 1671. Of course, this is kind of hypocritical because if it weren't for the Native Americans, of course, the Puritans would not have uh, survived as long as they did. Now, for each of these uh, periods, and we'll go through early colonial expansion uh, kind of quickly because it's, it's really easy to understand and it's not on the 2020 exam, so uh, we'll move through it quickly. We're going to talk about factors that motivated westward expansion in this time period. So in this one, indentured serv servitude, the phenomena that brought a lot of uh, laborers to early colonies, especially in New, New England, of course, stipulated that for four to seven years, a worker would be tied to their master, but then they would get freedom. And when they got freedom, they would be uh, given land. But since all the good land was already taken, their land would be out in the so-called frontier, out in the forest, so they would have to move further and further inland. So kind of uh, by no other choice, they were territorially expanding. Also, there's an increase in co colonists. More people are fleeing England, particularly because of the English Civil War in the mid-1600s. So they're coming over to the colonies, and where you have more people, you need more space. And then also there's a greater desire for arable uh, land for cash crops. That's more so in the Chesapeake where they are growing tobacco to sell uh, back to Europe. Key events then will be what we tackle next. And key events during this early colonial expansion period are Bacon's Rebellion, which occurs in 1676 when freed indentured servants are encroaching upon Native American lands. The Native Americans resist and the indentured servants call upon the government in Jamestown to come help them. Since the government is in cahoots with Native Americans in uh, exchange of goods, they don't want to help the um, future competitors or freed indentured servants, so they refuse, and the indentured servants take it upon themselves to first slaughter the Indians and then burn down Jamestown, epically pictured here with Bacon uh, staring and watching. The other one, King Philip's War, which happens in Massachusetts, is of course as Puritans encroach further in, inward, uh, they come into conflict with various Indian tribes up there, which results in a uh, famous uprising of Native Americans against the colonial powers, which results uh, eventually in 10% of Puritan men dying. So it's uh, quite a heavy uh, consequence there. And then fi finally, we'll talk about results. Uh, these can be specific things. They can be more uh, dry driving forces or broad effects. Um, but in regard to early colonial expansion, you see as a result of this territorial expansion and of course coming to a head of Bay Bacon's Rebellion, an increased need for slave labor. So they call upon African slavery to fill that void. You see increased class divisions between those that have the good land on the coast and those that have the not best land further inland. And then it of course sours relations between the nat natives and the colonists, which is a theme that we will see moving on. So next period is the revolutionary period. And I chose this to be the image for um, this uh, era because it hopefully indicates to you that these colonies were for the most part um, situated along the Eastern seaboard, but uh, by 1763, after the French and Indian War, there's gonna be this desire to move further inland. 
the colonists help fight in the war. They help secure that land and uh, kick out the French. So why shouldn't they be able to move and seek more economic opportunity there? Well, Britain responds by placing the proclamation line uh, along the Appalachian Mountains saying, colonists, you cannot expand past this line because we don't want further um, conflict with the Native Americans. That, of course, does not happen, most epically with Pontiac's Rebellion, which is a rebellion in Na Native Americans in the Michigan area against encroaching co colonists. Okay, so motivating factors here are uh, a continuing increase in British settlement, which, of course, is leading to densely populated coastal areas. And as the density in those coastal areas grows, people want to get away from uh, the clutter, and so they move further inland. But the most important motivating factor here during the early, seven, early and mid 1700s is mercantilist competition between mercantilist powers, namely France and Britain, that are competing uh, for markets and money on the world stage. And as a result, that's where you get uh, the early land battles that will cause the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War um, is the first key event, and it also is kind of a motivating factor because it, of course, uh, spawns the whole revolutionary movement, which will culminate in the Revolutionary War and American independence. American independence, or the War for American Independence, ends in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris, which uh, cedes all land between the Mississippi River and the Appalachian Mountains to the new United States of America from Britain, and it allows America to move into that land uh, without any restrictions. There is but one restriction there, and it's that the British, in some cases, refuse to leave, which will, of course, be a cause for the War of 1812, but that's in the next era, so we'll deal with it then. As Americans settle and try to organize this new territory that they've acquired from the Treaty of Paris and the Re Revolutionary War, they have to figure out a way to organize it to make it profitable, both in terms of sales and taxes. And so eventually, under the Articles of Confederation government, they will pass a Northwest Ordinance, pictured here, which will organize uh, land in territories of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, put them on the path to statehood, but then also allow for the sale of that Western land, which was uh, incredibly helpful at the time because the federal government had no other way of making money. Now, as uh, the North Northwest Ordinance sort of stabilizes uh, that area politically and ter territorially. Um, once the Constitution is established in 1787, and then of course goes into effect in 1789, ratified by all the states in 1791, it will oversee how the federal government will get involved with the uh, settlement of the so-called frontier. And one of its tests with regard to territorial expansion is what to do with the Na Native Americans in this area. So there is a battle that takes place at the end of 1793 called the ba Battle of Fallen Timbers. It happens in modern day Indiana. And it's a battle between uh, Native tribes in the area and uh, American militiamen. It results in an, an American victory and the Treaty of Greenville, which cedes formally the land in the Northwest Territory from the natives to the Americans. So sort of America has to go about getting that land twice, first from the British who lay claim to it, and then the natives who also lay claim to it, which just goes to show you that land claims are dubious. Consequences and results from this period would be obviously more encroachment upon the nat natives and their land, and then lingering conflict between the colonies and Great Britain, because Great Britain refuses to leave um, these territories, but mostly it opens up opportunities for individual salvation on the frontier and allows for future American icons like Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett to make a name for themselves. All right, so on to more recognizable times. Here's a political cartoon from the 1840s called The March of Destiny. This was before Manifest Destiny had made its um, sort of place in the lexicon if you will, but you can see that Americans are starting out in Kentucky and they are pointing westward towards the sun and California, where hopefully they will be able to make it, uh, make it rich by getting gold and doing other sorts of hard work in the mountainous regions. This, of course, uh, spurs wagon trains, which will go out there and, of course, people on horses and whatnot. Note the Nat Native Americans are there, but they're living this sort of uncivilized lifestyle with the buffalo and who really gives about them. So American March of Destiny. All right, so the Manifest Destiny period is 
uh, spurred by a couple of factors. One, the Jeffersonian ideal that becomes pre prevalent during his presidency between 1800 and 1808, which of course is the idea that Americans will be their best version of citizen if they have land that they can call their own, because if you can put your hands into the soil, then you will of course do good by the country. This is sort of um, given a shot of adrenaline in 1845 when John O'Sullivan, who is a reporter for a New York newspaper, writes that it is Americans manifest destiny, thus coining the term to overspread the continent from sea to shy, shining sea. Now, why does this happen at this point? Well, the market revolution, which had begun in 1820, is requiring more resources and more land to be planted, especially with cotton, but also with food, because there is a growing pop population due much to immigration of Ger German and Irish people coming over, uh, fleeing whatever strife was um, happening in their country. And so you have a multitude of factors here. Now this one, key events, we have beginning the period in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase, where America buys Louisiana from France. Uh, we also have the Adams Onus Treaty in 1819, which is where America purchases Florida from Spain, which is a big deal because it uh, gets out of the area a potential competitor, but then also allows for the Americans to liquidate any Native Americans in the area. That, of course, will be sealed in 1831 with the Indian Removal Act. Now, once um, America eases its strife with Great Britain, uh, a bunch of opportunities open in the Northwest in places like Oregon and Northern California, which are increasingly important because America wants to enter Asian markets. This, of course, is at the same time of the Opium Wars, which means that China has now been formally opened up to Western trading, and therefore, why not have ports and other uh, resource endeavors on the West Coast, because that kind of stuff can be shipped to Asia and sold at a premium. So this allows for many Americans to jet jettison to the West on Oregon and Santa Fe trails, which of course have been memorialized by video games. Uh, in addition, you have at the very uh, same time um, provoking of war with Mexico, James K. Polk sending American troops into a, disported, a dis disputed border region, which of course provokes the Mexicans uh, to fire back, thus leading to a war. America having uh, been on the industrial up and up, Mexico having not, America easily wins that war and is granted the Mexican cession or the territories of California, New Mexico, and uh, Utah. Now, during the war, at the tail end of it, will be the gold rush. And before the war ends with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Americans find gold in California, which technically belonged, uh, politically at least, to the Mexicans, but it is uh, not disclosed until after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is signed, and therefore Americans now lay claim to all the gold that they find in California in 1848 and 1849 during the gold rush. Now this one is incredibly important because what it does is it encourages the population of California, um, which was already diverse because there were natives, there were Mexicans, there were Americans that had uh, gotten the early jump out there, but it just sees a stream of various Americans, mostly low, lower class, out to try and make it rich in California, many of which don't. Uh, but California gets a uh, spike in population that allows for them to apply for statehood. So in 1850, they apply for statehood, which of course blows up into a big mess because does California come in as a free state or a slave state? It sort of, it straddles the line. And so it's not an easy decision. So Henry Clay comes back from the dead to broker a compromise to kick slavery down the line a little bit more. And then uh, in 1854, of course, the slavery question is re resurrected with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which was the topic of last week, so I won't uh, indulge upon that now. Now, consequences and results of this time period. Most important is the increase in sectional tensions, mostly over slavery, but also over ideology. There's increased tension with na Native Americans, and there is increased nativism towards diverse Western populations. John C. Calhoun, our most famous horrible pop politician is on record for saying, I don't want to go to war with Mexico. That would force us to annex a place with brown people. And so um, there was some uh, xenophobia and racism involved there. One important point that I want to make that I've left off of this one is that there is an early, um, an early entrance to the conversation of people questioning whether this is a good thing. You might recall that there was a uh, group of artists known as the Hudson River School that 
painted pictures of landscapes that really questioned whether American manifest destiny would be good in the long run because it would change the landscape in ways that uh, might be regrettable. The most fam famous painting, of course, was the Oxbow, drawn by Thomas Cole in the 1830s. All right, so now let's move on. And of course, uh, hopefully you recognize this one. And if you saw it coming, then good for you. You're in great shape. But there's um, an angelic figure who's, you know, holding um, the, who's hold, holding a school book there because she's going to bring civilization, the telegraph, and all of this wonderful um, ness that America has to boast, like trains and plows and civilized farming and whatnot. And what are we going to be replacing? Well, of course, the heathenist Native Americans, wilderness and wild animals, and the buffalo. Um, so, I mean, this painting is called American Progress. It was made in 1872, only seven years after the Civil War ended, and therefore was probably an effort to A, promote more westward expansion, but um, also to promote American unity because America was kind of a hot mess. Uh, at this time. All right, so the wild, wild west, motivating factors to Americans moving out there between 1860 and 1900. Well, the Civil War is over, and what do we do with all those guns? Makes sense to turn them on both buffalo and peoples, and there's some out there that need to be treated. So let's send former soldiers with nothing else to do but shoot their guns out there to clean things up. Technological innovation also playing a role, bigger machines, better trains, better tra transportation, better mining equipment, better agricultural equipment, all of that can allow for more people to settle more effectively in areas that weren't really reachable prior to that. The 13th Amendment, which frees the slaves in 1865, there is now a bulk of uh, Black Americans in the South that have nothing to do. Many move west onto homesteads, not as many as, as uh, probably sh uh, should have been allowed to, but uh, there were some. The most famous uh, settlement of Black homesteaders was at Nicodemus, it's in Kansas. Um, there's also increasing pop population along the eastern seaboard. Remember, this is uh, right at the height of the Gilded Age, which means you get another wave of immigration, particularly from southeastern Europe, flooding into American cities and creating a very densely populated uh, area. That leads some to say, all right, I'm out. I'm going to take my chances in the West. And then, of course, there are incidences in which uh, precious resources are found on Native American lands, particularly gold in the Black Hills, which was previously a Native American reservation, but uh, it would be turned quickly into a mining operation because you can't let the Native Americans sit on gold. All right, so key events in this era. The Homestead Act obviously encourages westward uh, expansion because it gives land away for very cheap prices to um, otherwise uh, rising social beings. So by that, I mean uh, low-class people that are looking for a way up in uh, the social hi hierarchy. There are cattle drives that take place. The most famous one is called the Chisholm Trail, but I don't know why you would ever need to know that. They're prevalent from 1865 until 1890, but take a severe hit in 1874 when barbed wire is invented, thus allowing for cattle ranching to become a lot easier and a lot more profitable. The Comstock Load is a silver strike in Nevada in 1859 and lasts for about 20 years, but it indicates to us that there is a mining boom. Um, most of the time, of course, the mi mining towns would be around for a little while and then their resources would be depleted and then they would leave, thus leading to ghost towns. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, which of course would allow for materials to be more effectively shipped across the country, would allow for people to move um, with more incentive out to the West. But we also see an increase in tensions between settlers and the Native Americans. This is best exemplified by Little Bighorn in 1876. The Dawes Act, which um, is sort of cultural assimilation to an exponential degree. This is where Native Americans on reservations would have their communal land taken and individualized in a uh, capitalist style of uh, individual landowning plots, which would um, encourage them to live more like Americans. Hopefully you recall the fam famous pictures of Native Americans that were assimilated at places like the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania. And then of course you see heightened American 
xenophobia towards Asians because many of them had settled during the earlier period and during the early part of this period. And this culminates in the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1881, which uh, refuses chi Chinese immigration to the United States. There's also another one in the 1890s called the Gentleman's Agreement that's made with Japan that essentially does the same thing. Now, consequences of this one, this essentially ends Native American resistance, uh, best exemplified by the battle at Wounded Knee Creek in 1890, where there's a massacre of Native Americans that are uh, simply dancing in an effort to try and uh, get their white oppressors to leave, and they are mowed down by uh, the American mil military. You also see the expansion of the corporate presence in uh, westward expansion. So this is where industrial capitalism really takes over the territorial expansion process. Agriculture is turned into corporate agriculture, mining is turned into corporate endeavors, and meatpacking, of course, you know the story of that one. Meat packers start to buy everything through uh, their method of ver vertical integration. There is a perpetuation of the frontier as a part of the American identity, which will become a problem in the next uh, era. We see the first sort of uh, wide ranging protests of treatment of, in, of Native Americans as a result of westward expansion. This is popularized by a book written in 1881 called Century of Dishonor by Helen Hunt Jackson. While Americans had protested the treatment of the Na Native Americans in the 1830s and 40s, it was not really a national movement. Uh, here, it becomes more national because this is a na na national book that's on the presses that people can get get their hands on. It's making it into a moral issue similar to what Uncle Tom's Cabin did with slavery. And then there will be eventual environmental concerns toward the tail end of this period, um, best exemplified by John Muir and the emergence of the Sierra Club, a progressive group that protested the changing of the American uh, landscape. All right, and now we will bring it uh, full circle and talk about the last period, and that would be American imperialism. The, you might have seen this painting before. There, of course, is the American eagle who is stre stretching its wings from uh, Latin America to the Philippines and, of course, waving the American flag in its beak. But you can see that um, at the bottom, it says his 128th birthday and it says, gee, but this is an awful stretch, which, of course, is satirical, indicating that whoever drew this is probably not in favor of American expansion. Okay, so the motivating factors of American territorial expansion in the 1890s. I would argue the most important one uh, that's not material, at least, is Frederick Jackson's frontier thesis. This scared a lot of people because a lot of Americans had seen the frontier as this uh, place where they could go to make a name for themselves and strike it big or have, at least have a more enjoyable life. And now that the frontier no longer existed, what are we going to do now? How will America... Uh, and especially American identity, exist from here on out. There's also imperial competition. This is when uh, Europe is at uh, the height of its imperial endeavors. Social Darwinism, or the idea that Western nations uh, and areas are just better than uh, the rest. My favorite, the crisis of American manhood, which basically said that uh, American men were growing sort of uh, fe feeble and yellow in an effort to stand up to the rest of the world. So they had to prove themselves on a world stage. Um, economic opportunities, I would argue, was the most important. Uh, the race for resources and opportunity uh, to keep up with other countries in terms of markets and selling goods. Since America was now the industrial powerhouse of the world, uh, it could sell its products to more places. And then, of course, an opportunity to spread American military interests throughout the globe. We needed coaling stations for our big ships. And how, are you, how else will you get them other than taking places along the way? So key events. In 1867, we annex Alaska. We buy it from Russia for $7.2 million, which was a steal. Um, in 1898, we uh, annex Hawaii after literally stealing it from uh, the Hawaiians that live there. And as you recall, the American government initially uh, balks at the idea, says, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, we'll let you planters deal with it on your own. And then the planters take it upon themselves. And then the government gets uh, sees the opportunity there and jump, jumps in. In 1898 also, there's a six-month war between America and Spain, the Spanish-American War, which 
uh, catapults America onto the world stage as being sort of now the new policeman of the world, especially in the Western Hemisphere. Um, as a result of that one, where Americans are granted the Philippines, uh, the Filipinos re um, respond by fighting for their freedom just in the same vein that America fought for its freedom against Britain. And that leads to an insurrection of Filipinos between 1899 and 1902. Of course, the insurrection is eventually put down and America holds the Philippines until after World War II. In 1906, in a message to Congress, Theodore Roosevelt, president at the time, says basically that America will be the overseer of Latin America. So the United States will oversee other uh, countries in the Western Hemisphere, making sure that they behave themselves. And that, of course, uh, will be um, the foundation of his diplomacy, which we'll get to in a second. And then finally, American, uh, America sees through the finishing of the Panama Canal, which allows for more easily transport of goods from New York into the Pacific Ocean, but then also military ships from one ocean to the other, thus allowing America to be a truly global military power. Now, consequences from this one, debates over imperial expansion grow um, exponentially. So this is a, a much more loud and much more uh, vociferous group than had existed before because uh, it's on the world stage, A, and anti-imperialist rhetoric had been building throughout the world. So uh, a lot of Americans picked that up. Um, and of course, some very pr prominent Americans from Jane Addams to Mark Twain started the Anti-Imperialist League. Uh, like I alluded to before, America becomes a global power as a result of this, that this one, now having a seat at uh, the table with regard to making global div diplomatic affairs. But then it leads to a series of um, American di diplomatic efforts, particularly in Latin America. First, big stick diplomacy, which is characterized mostly by intimidation. Dollar diplomacy, which is characterized mostly by business interests and uh, allowing for business, American business interests to thrive in Latin America. And then moral diplomacy, which is masked as sort of a um, way to help Latin American countries get up to speed morally, but actually turns out to be just forcing American morals on other places. Okay, so now that we've gone through all of the, the eras, I want to identify uh, examples of change and examples of continuity throughout them. So changes that occur, obviously the location of American expansion changes over time. We piecemeal and add things as time goes. Um, another change is that attitudes become more mixed over time. You see much more pushback against American imperialism between 1890 and 1914 than you did um, in the revolutionary period, or even during Man Manifest Destiny, there wasn't really a lot of people, other than the tran transcendentalists, asking if this was right uh, or wrong. You see increased involvement of the federal government over time. In those earlier periods, it was just sort of plucky individuals that uh, led the westward expansion, but by uh, the post-Civil War era, you see the American government taking the lead and using the military to expand their power. Uh, and then that leads us to the last one, the military will uh, eventually oversee the process. So at the beginning, it wasn't the military that was do doing things with some exception. I mean, I know the Battle of Fallen Timbers was a mil military endeavor, but the battles had begun because individuals had been settling out there on their own. Uh, but by the Spanish-American War, obviously the mil military is being uh, used tr tremendously. Now, continuities, it's always a part of American identity. What, whether it's just moving further inland, um, that's part of the identity of the co colonists. Whether it's moving to Kentucky because that's seen as the frontier, that's part of identity. Manifest destiny, part of identity. Um, policing the world becomes part of uh, American identity. Additionally, many Americans this is, uh, see this as an opportunity for individual sal salvation, be it economic, be it psychological, whatever. The frontier is an opportunity for them uh, to experience more happy lives. Um, it's tied closely to economic development. So the periods where we see expansion most ra rapidly are periods where the economy is expanding and or ch changing. Usually, we see um, when the economy is in need of resources, we uh, Americans will expand um, and look for those resources wherever they can find them. And then finally, of course, it's uh, a company's period of economic growth 
um, which we just said. Another continuity is, of course, that Native Americans are sort of at the expense of all of this. And when I was doing research for this presentation, I stumbled upon this political cartoon, which I realized has a lot of words. But otherwise, I, I uh, see it as just being very uh, emblematic of the American expansion experience and the impact that it had on the Na Native Americans. Obviously, a Na Native American is being chopped up. And you see that different groups are involved. So the U.S. courts cutting the hair, U.S. marshals bringing over the tomahawk, right? And there's just a lot that are happening here. You see the railroads are sort of taking out their feet. Then lands in Alabama and Arkansas, Cherokee Nation, the Shawnee over there. So it's a very uh, intricate political cartoon as they usually were in the 1830s and 40s, uh, but really goes to show, show you how... Um, much of an impact this was having on the Native Americans early on. So basically, what do we have here? We have an America that grows up through expansion. Eventually, by uh, the age of imperialism, it will uh, have grown so much that the rest of the world will be looking to it for handouts. It's a good thing that the rest of the world no longer looks for America uh, Amer America's help and that America do doesn't uh, see a need to impose itself anywhere. Um, yeah, so it looks like we've made a lot of prog progress. All right, so that's it for me.